Hello and welcome to everyone who's watching this very important dis panel discussion wherever you may be. And it's entitled Redefining Business as Usual, which I think translated means what on earth is happening, what is going to happen next, and how do we all find opportunities in it. And I think many of you watching have some big burning questions like, when are we ever going to fly again? Is it safe to fly? When are our kids ever going to get to school or go and see schools? When on earth can we go and see a sports game? What do we do to behave with dignity in the face of these strong social protests that have erupted in recent years, uh, recent days? I mean, days, weeks, months are all blending right now. And what does this mean for the economy and the business community? And we have an absolutely fantastic panel of people to talk to us about this this, morning, this afternoon uh, in terms of showing what's actually happening and where we're going next. Ed Bastian, who is a man who needs almost no introduction, who is CEO of Delta Airlines. And I'm sure we have a lot of questions for him about when we get back to <coughs> business as usual in this new world. Janet Napolitano, who is president of the University of California, who is overseeing a not just a major educational establishment in America, but also at the forefront of the discussion, both about how you bring back students to campus safely, what it means for education going forward, and also how we deal with these big issues about gender, race, diversity going forward. And Casey Wasserman, who's in charge of Wasserman, well, created the Wasserman um, group, which has been a leading group in sports and marketing and talent management in recent years, who's at the center of these discussions. So I'd like to start with you, Ed, and say, how has it been in the last few weeks? Well, it's starting to recover. Uh, you know, we bottomed out somewhere in the middle of April under all the restrictions and the stay-at-home orders. We down to probably only about 5% of our average traffic. Uh, since that time, we've tripled in size, so we were up 15%. I never thought getting a triple in overall market share was going to be, I'd be so excited. You know, it's, it's, but that puts us at 15% of where we sit today. Uh, the, uh, there's, there's a Certainly a, a demographic that's traveling, it tends to be younger, uh, people that are seeking adventure, people that are price bargains. But as the economy starts to open, as, as the casinos open, as Disney starts to open, as you know, cities start to provide opportunities for people to interact and get out in restaurants, we're finding people wanting to travel again. But it's, it's not business travel, it's uh, very much a leisure-oriented group right now. And just very quickly, when you look forward the next two or three months, are you presuming that come the autumn, you're going to be operating, what, at 50% capacity, 20%, 70%, any sense of visibility going forward? I would imagine by Labor Day, we'll be around 50%. And that'll be another important milestone for us, because typically business travel picks up again after Labor Day, once, once the summer uh, vacation and holiday period is over. Uh, so we'll have to see the degree to which businesses are actually starting to open their doors. Most of our big corporate accounts are not traveling right now. Most of the big corporations are not open uh, for, uh, for business. There's no sales conferences to go to. There's no one to see on the other side. But hopefully, if we continue to make progress in, in the reopening over the next few months, uh, Labor Day should be a good, a good test. And if we pass that test, uh, and I think a lot of it's going to be dictated by advances on the vaccine, on the medical front, on people feeling confident that it's safe uh, to travel, then I think we'll, we'll start to hopefully see another, another tick forward. But I think, candidly, Jillian, this is about a three-year recovery. Wow. Wow. Well, that really is going to be a question of how you find opportunity in this time of disruption. And I'm going to come back to you in a moment and ask you what it's going to take to build trust amongst the American public and also how you see the structure of aviation changing in the future, because it's gonna be hard to go back to as we were before the crisis. But before I do that, Janet, you must be besieged with questions right now from anxious parents. I mean, can you talk to anybody without, without <laughs> them asking what on earth is gonna happen? But tell us briefly what is gonna happen in September, because I think people watching want to know very badly. Well, um, it turns out that reopening a campus is much uh, more complicated than shutting one down and 
Uh, we shut, uh, shut down and depopulated the campuses very quickly in the spring. Uh, um, and now we are working through all of the complicated issues involved with um, safety. Um, uh, uh, what kinds of classes can we safely hold in person uh, versus those that will remain uh, distance learning or online learning? Uh, uh, how do we repopulate the dorms? What's the dorm density going to look like? Um, I think at the University of California at our campuses, you're going to see a hybrid. Uh, much of the academic uh, program will still be online. Uh, but uh, smaller classes, class sections, fewer than uh, 25 uh, students uh, in person, wet labs in person, uh, performing arts, studio arts, those kinds of things that really uh, uh, are, are, it's necessary to be uh, physically there, will be endeavoring to be in person. Uh, and with respect to the dormitories, uh, I don't think you'll be seeing any triples um, uh, in the dorms, uh, but we are endeavoring to see uh, at some of our campuses whether they are, there can be doubles. One of the right. things we're waiting for is guidance from the State Department of Public Health. Um, uh, the higher ed segment still doesn't have the guidance there, which will be the baseline requirements that we have to meet. So. While we've established our own threshold safety measures, uh, we're still waiting for the, the, the state guidance to go on top of that. That's very interesting. Well, I wanna come back in a moment to pick, ask you both the question of what it's gonna to take to really build trust and confidence and whether you are getting enough clarity and consistency in terms of the messaging there. Um, but first of all, Casey, when are we gonna start seeing sports matches like we used to know them again? Well, you're seeing them now without, without spectators. So uh, the real question is when are spectators? You're going to see much like Janet was talking about, and frankly, Ed's operating, whether it's 5% or 15% or 50%, his planes have people on them. So um, those are environments where they can control people. And I think a sports stadium is an environment where you can control people. You can separate them, whether you checkerboard the seating or whatever. Uh, you can certainly create... Um, physical distancing in an arena, in an outdoor stadium, pretty straightforward. Um, it comes ironically back to a question of comfort and trust. Uh, what are the requirements for people in those buildings? Is it masks? Is it uh, bring your own food so you don't go to food stands? How do you manage, you know, some sports easier than others, baseball easier because pace of play is different so you can get up and go. But think about a, a National Football League game everyone goes to the bathroom at the quarter and the halftime breaks. Well, how do you control people going to the bathroom? Uh, in a physically distant? You know, there's some weird nuances to each and every sport. Golf is easier than others. Um, so sports is one of the few pieces of the live entertainment business that can create some um, economic activity without spectators. Obviously the concert's hard. Um, the, the, the uh, phys you know, Broadway, those kinds of things, very difficult. Uh, sports can, and you're going to start to see modest amounts of fans coming back. And to me, until there's a medical either remedy or solution, it's a really simple thing, which is testing, 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 testing. And, you know, look, we all get on Ed's planes and, you know, TSA pre-check clear. We've given more information to get those benefits than you would by testing yourself before you went to a sporting event and validating that you were, you know, virus free. So, I think the airline industry actually, in terms of managing customers, managing people, flows, movement, information, privacy, security, transparency, is probably the, one of the best places we can learn from on how this information can be used to open things up without a medical solution. So let me go back to that, because that's a really interesting point about the masks. Um, I'm trained as a cultural anthropologist, and as you may or may not know, there's actually a large body of cultural analysis of mask wearing in Asia that anthropologists have done in recent years. And when the whole COVID-19 crisis came, I had friends of mine saying, can you ever imagine a situation where the Americans would all be wearing masks? And I had to say, pretty hard. And yet you look at what's happened, say with ski helmets and how they've suddenly come in, or you look at what's happened in the aviation industry and people's behavior does change. So I'm curious, Ed, how did people learn to accept all the controls that were put in place in the aviation industry after 9-11? And do you think a day will come where we just automatically put a mask on before we get on a plane? Well, Is that going know, to be the secret? 
after after 9-11, it was a controlled environment. You could not get into the secured parts of the airport until you went through TSA. Now, people may not, may forget, but TSA came about as a result of 9-11, was, was instituted. So it, you couldn't get access, you know, without act, actually having cleared. And the, the clearance checks were, were, were vigorous as they, they continue to be today. Uh, but you know, as, you, as you now say, what can we learn from that? Uh, you know, we do think TSA has a role to play. It could be in temperature screening. We've, we've asked uh, TSA to take on a role of temp screening. We haven't, we haven't gotten agreement yet with the government to do something like that. Uh, masks are really important. And unfortunately, it's gotten into a bit of a political debate uh, in recent, recent days, uh, wanting to make a statement about not wearing a mask. But at Delta, and I know the other airlines are doing much of the same, is we're telling people you cannot get on board a plane without wearing your mask. And if you decide to take your mask off while you're flying and you don't uh, obey the flight attendant who will kindly ask you two or three times to put your mask back on, unless you're eating or there's some specific reason why you can't wear a mask, uh, you're, you're gonna lose your privilege to fly Delta in the future. So we don't, wow. we don't want round airplanes, it's not a TSA security issue, but we have to take it very seriously, just like someone who would disobey not wearing their seatbelt or standing while the, the plane is taxiing, we would not allow. You know, masks for the next uh, 12 months, you know, maybe longer, are gonna be one of, one of those protocols that we're gonna have to get used to. So memo to anyone who's watching who wants to go out and sell masks, you know, there's gonna be a long market there for a long time. I say my daughter's has gone out and bought a whole bunch of fashion masks, which she's <laughs> um, <laughs> very proud of. Um, but Janet, I mean, are you expecting to make masks mandatory on campus? And do you see that as being a political flashpoint? Because frankly, political tensions are running pretty high um, in many areas at the moment, and millennials are pretty fired up. Well, I do think masks will be part and parcel of being at, at the university. It's a, uh, it's a matter of public safety and public health. And you know, universities are communities and uh, people owe a, you know, a responsibility, not just to themselves, but to other members of the community. And I think that's the way we need to approach it. Uh, uh, the question will be, uh, how will uh, a mask uh, requirement be enforced? Um, and um, I think it'll be much like the airlines. There'll be some polite requests uh, uh, maybe several, um, and, uh, and, and then ultimately it, it may uh, require that a, a student not be physically present on campus. Wow. Who would have imagined a few years ago? I mean, who would imagine the mask would become compulsory at, you know, Broadway show if they ever reopen anytime soon or the games, Casey? Um, extraordinary times. What does this mean though? Let's get, let's get, um, talk about some numbers though. What does this mean in terms of business? Because, None of you are expecting a rapid return to normal anytime soon. Um, Ed, the airlines have been supported by the government. Is that going to continue indefinitely? What happens when that funding runs out? And where do you see say, the aviation industry at the end of this in two years time? Well, I've got to give the administration credit. They, you know, while it was not politically popular, they did decide that the, the airlines specifically were one of the first industries that they needed to keep together you know, right after the uh, pandemic. They grounded our, our planes, our ability to fly. And uh, the, the, uh, the stimulus that we received gives us uh, the ability for about six months to hold on to all our staff. In fact, it's a requirement that any airline taking the, the stimulus money cannot lay off uh, any of their staff or cut the rates of pay of any of their staff. And you see various airlines around the world where the governments haven't been as supportive and those airlines have, com have been completely decimated. Their staff was let go immediately. And again, we're only down to about 15% of our normal revenue. So we would not be able to be keeping our people uh, employed as we are. It gives us a chance to get to the other side of this to see what condition we're in. So we'll be holding all of our staff in, in place till the end of September. My hope is we'll be able to figure out how to not go through a massive furlough at that point. Uh, we've got a very large uh, voluntary effort for people to take time off without pay. In fact, I've got fully half, almost 40,000 of my staff who are off taking the time without pay anywhere from 30 to 120 days as we speak, which is just phenomenal. 
Uh, they, we they, have a, they volunteered that or you told them all to? Or? It's all completely voluntary. Of course, the unemployment qualifications helped compensate them for some of that lost earnings. Uh, we've got a very, very large uh, early retirement program going on. I expect we'll probably get maybe up to 10,000 people to, uh, to, to uh, retire. This wasn't what their plan was for this year to retire, but we've made it quite, uh, quite uh, appealing for people to do that and put a nice uh, retiree medical package in place to, to assist uh, people that decide. But all, all those steps are voluntary. And then once we, we see where the numbers land in the next month or two, we'll try to figure out how to allocate work amongst the remaining staff to, to minimize any furloughs that we have across the company. That said, I, I do think we're only going to be, you asked me earlier if we'll be at 50% by October 1. I don't think so. I think we'll, we may be flying 50%, but I don't think demand will be up to 50%. Right. So I'm just curious before I turn to the other two and ask them about this. If you look forward, say, in two years' time, and obviously none of us have a crystal ball, but do you expect to see an airline industry that's, say, half the size of what it was four or five months ago, um, two-thirds of the size? Do you expect to see a lot of consolidation? Um, are we going to emerge from this? You know, it, it, is it basically a bit like a laptop where we basically, you hit a problem, you switch it off, you reboot it, switch it back on and ping, it comes back again, or is it going to be fundamentally altered? Uh, you, you want me to take that, Julie? I, 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 don't... I, I think we'd love to hear that. And then I'm going to toss the same question to Janet and to Casey. Yeah, I... I fair, they, have time, they have time to think about the answer first, but you know. <laughs> I don't think you're going to see this continue on for an extended period of time. You know, once there is a vaccine, and given all of the effort around the world to develop vaccines and it's widely available, I think you're gonna see our business return fairly substantially. Now, it won't go back to 100%, I'd say maybe 80% in the next two years, uh, but the vaccine, the, the advances in therapeutics, when people feel like there's a, there's a cure if in case they contract the disease, and once people understand their own risk on the, the, the pendulum, you know, if they've already have the immunity, if they have antibodies, the effectiveness of those antibodies, uh, there's, there's a lot of work that, that's going away. For example, we're testing all of our employees, both with the active wow. virus as well as the antibodies, to get a really good sense for our 90,000 where they sit relative to that. And I think more, as more corporations and more, and we, we have found you know, some of our employees who have antibodies that didn't know it, we found actually a couple of active, active virus. If people are the active virus, thankfully they weren't at work, uh, but they came in to get tested and, and they knew. So as more and more information comes out, as herd immunity hopefully starts to develop over, over the next uh, you know, 12 months, I think in the US, you'll see the airline industry start to you know, meaningfully pick up and get back to maybe 75 or 80%. <laughs> Internationally, I think it's gonna take a little bit longer than that. Wow. Well, I guess many of us watching wish that we could all get, be tested quite so swiftly that you, in the way that you've organized for your staff. Um, I know I certainly do. But um, Casey, when you look two years down, are we going to have any Broadway shows back? Is Broadway going to ever be the same again? And are you just resigned to the fact that when the laptop reboots in terms of the economy, it's just going to look fundamentally different? Um, no, I look, I think whether it's, I think all live events, concerts, um, Broadway, sporting events, it will be before two years where those will start to look a lot more like they used to than they do now, which is <laughs> essentially empty. Um, uh, I just think between testing and, and medical advancements, um, that's going to happen sooner than later. Um, I think once people do understand, as Ed rightly said, their risk profile, what it means, um, their ability to go to events with a testing protocol, I think it's gonna change very rapidly because much like travel, there's a huge pent up demand um, for people to, I, people are human, human beings are in human nature is they wanna be together, they wanna travel, they wanna you know, be in communities, whether it's at the universities or, you know, um, or at a sporting event or on an airplane going to a vacation or to a work trip. So there will be some changes for sure. There will, you will see, you know, sporting events will operate a little differently. You probably won't see a lot of cash transacting. You'll probably see a lot more grab and goes for concessions. You'll see different um, architecture around bathrooms. I mean, you know, things like that that are probably long overdue. Um, you'll see different cleaning protocols. Um, but as Ed rightly pointed out, look, on September 10th, 2001, I could have gone to an airport 
with a mask and a beard and a hat and sunglasses and a bag and no one would ask me a question. I could have gone to any building in New York City and gone to any floor I wanted to on September 12th and forevermore, you can't do that. And so there's gonna be a new normal around health. It's probably a good thing, uh, obviously not at this cost, but it's, it's a good thing long-term for the health of human beings. And you're gonna see it in places where there's mass aggregations. And I also do think, and I'm not one of them, there's a large portion of our population who thinks they're in, invincible. Younger people who don't, aren't afraid. I'm not sure my kids would be afraid to go to a Travis Scott show right now or a, or a NBA game if they could. Um, and thinking about schools. For every kid I hear, including mine too, who talk about, please, I wanna be homeschooled, I hate school. After four <laughs> weeks of homeschooling on, on Zoom calls, all they could do was beg to go back to school. So <laughs> whether it's you know in high school, like my two high schoolers or, or any of the universities, I'm a UCLA alumni. I mean, the experience of college is special and people are gonna to wanna to go back to that. And so I, I don't, I think we have short memories in this, in this world and I think you're gonna see seeing things return to normal much more quickly than probably people guess. Well, I must say, I think it's indeed the only time in history that high school students are clamoring to get back to school as fast as they can. Um, my, my, uh, say, my, but... <laughs> my focus group of two can speak to that. <laughs> yeah, so can my focus group of two. But um, I should say, by the way, that anyone watching, if you do want to ask a question of any of the speakers, um, we have the Q&A function where you do feel free to ask questions. Um, and I think probably a lot of the issues they're touching on is very close to all of us. But Janet, what is this going to mean for the future of education? Because there's been a lot of discussion about the things we've learned from this experience, which are positive and beneficial, not just terrible challenges. And I'm curious, is it your presumption that two, three, four, five years time, we're going to have a lot more higher education happening online instead of in person? Um, do you think we're going to see a lot of consolidation because a lot of colleges are going to face severe financial constraints from this? Um, how do you see this developing? And is there any upside to what's going on? Oh, I think, I think there is an upside. Um, I think uh, uh, we're discovering new ways to use technology and learning that uh, will allow us to expand capacity. Um, but at the same time, I agree with Casey, the, uh, the residential college experience is a very special experience. It's not just about classes. It's it's about forming friendships, it's extracurriculars, it's athletics, uh, it's being part of a learning community. Uh, and there's a tremendous demand uh, at that. And so what I think we'll see, uh, at least for large public universities like the University of California, is uh, a, a return in the next uh, few years to uh, a full population of the campuses, uh, but with an add-on of more classes, uh, more variety of classes in terms of uh, taking them online, in person, uh, and the like. But the in the meantime, I think we're gonna see some other changes. Uh, for example, uh, going to travel. Um, I think you're gonna see a lot less um, uh, travel to things like academic conferences. and things of that sort, because it turns out that video Zoom works pretty well. And uh, that is a way to uh, uh, keep costs down while at the same time uh, allowing scholars still to interact with, with each other. I think in terms of the business operations of, of the university, and, and remember, we're the third largest employer in the state of California, uh, I think we'll wow. see uh, many of our employees uh, continue to work from home uh, and, and not uh, uh, return to a traditional office setting five days a week. And, and there'll be changes in the work pattern because, because of that. So I think uh, the, the, the core educational residential college experience at a place like the University of California uh, will, will come back um, uh, bigger and better. Uh, but there's, there's going to be changes to some of the way that uh, the work surrounding that gets accomplished. Is there any, and this is a question for any of you, any upside about what's happened? I mean, Janet has just pointed out that, you know, the whole impetus behind online education has accelerated to a certain degree. But I'm curious, when you look back in, say, five, ten years' time, what are the big silver linings that you can see in this cloud? You know, you one, hope to see? one that I can see is 
the way that uh, uh, science is done. We have seen tremendous uh, 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 work across the globe by scientists from uh, uh, countries far and near uh, working together uh, to um, find new therapeutics, uh, to do the basic science required for a vaccine. Um, I, I don't think uh, we have in our lifetime seen such a huge effort by uh, the world's scientists to get, to get a handle on this. Yeah, I don't think the term epidemiologist has ever seemed quite so cool. <laughs> um, as far as millennials are concerned, you're going to get all these kids growing up and when they want to grow up, they don't want to be bankers anymore. They want to be epidemiologists and save the world. But um, Ed or Casey, any silver linings for you? Yeah, I think there's a fair number of them. First of all, it's going to give us a new view on resilience, you know, resilience of, of the health of our people. How do we take better care of safety, of, you know, just the physical flight of safety, but the actual health of our and well-being of our people as well as our customers. You know, one, one of the real challenges the U.S. airline industry has is a lot of really under-invested in infrastructure. And we're going to take the time, <laughs> while traffic base is very low, to accelerate, I call it, pull forward our future and, and make progress. So at LAX, which is in the, we're in the midst of a, a massive rebuild of Terminals 2 and 3, we're going to be able to shave two years off the development timeline because people are not in the airport and we can build it while people are down. We're doing the same thing at LaGuardia, uh, so doing the same thing in Salt Lake City. Uh, we're doing the same thing with technology, you know, because technology, with all the volumes being lower, we can actually advance and make more technology and more digital advances on a quicker pace rather than having to operate it while you're implementing, you know, new design features and, and opportunities. In our aircraft, the same thing. Any aircraft that uh, was scheduled to retire in the next five years we're retiring now. So you're going to have <laughs> fuel efficiency. It's going to be better for the environment. It's going to be better for you know, our ability to kind of fast forward our way into that future. So I think there's, there's a fair bit. And I agree with Janet's point that there's, there's travel that will be not returning, some, some form of business travel. But really, that, that travel should not have been there in the first place. Those you know, overnight trips to Europe for a one-day meeting and turning around and flying back, they're very inefficient. They're very they're unproductive. Uh, our business model should not be built on that type of travel. Uh, it's going to be built with a, with a higher quality. And, it's, and as a result, it's going to be a more resilient, more durable base of travel in the future. And I also happen to think, though, we are all going to get really tired of these Zoom calls here. In the not <laughs> People are going to I must say for myself, I, I, I feel for the first time for 20 years, I'm actually experiencing what it feels like to be not jet lagged. And yeah, I'm sure <laughs> many other people are feeling that for the first time. I mean, Ed, you must be, you must spend your life going around the, or you used to spend your life going around, around the world all the time, I imagine. I do. And I'm still traveling. I'm, I'm still out in the airports every week. Not around the world wow. as much as the US I am, yeah. I'm going to ask you in a moment both um, all to reflect briefly about what this means for issues like climate change. And obviously we need to address the issue about diversity in a second. But Casey, any, any silver linings for you? Uh, I would say there's opportunity, you know, other than specific, as Ed talked about his business or, or Janet talked about universities specific to businesses, I would just think societally, I, I'm, there are certainly opportunities for silver linings. I just hope we don't forget about them. Um, if anybody questioned the effect that human beings have on the environment, you should have spent from March 11th forward in Los Angeles and seen bluer skies than you've ever seen. And I've lived here 45 years. Um, you know, the, the, there's, there's so many things that I think we didn't think about, the, the value of our health, um, the value of our time. Uh, while business travel may change, I know it's obviously not going away, I think personal travel will grow exponentially because people now realize they can go on a trip or go to a second location and, and work or go on a camping trip that they otherwise didn't think they could and do a Zoom call and be quite productive. So I hope we don't waste um, all of this in terms of, of what that means, uh, traffic, uh, commuting, culture, all those things that we now understand and think about and are, are sort of pushing forward with, I, I hope that our memories don't fade too quickly because uh, it would, you know, we will have learned to be incredibly resilient, um, but I would, I am worried that we will forget um, some of the silver linings that, that we are experiencing that they, that they don't last because again, you know, we are, we are, we are, uh, 
quite prone to repeating our mistakes. <laughs> On the issue of the environment, I mean, Janet, you pointed out that scientists have been shown to be in some ways the superstars in the last few months. Is this going to make populations and most importantly, politicians finally wake up and listen to the science on climate change, do you think? Or is it going to actually undermine the move towards actually addressing climate change? Well, I'm, I'm at heart an optimist and uh, I have to uh, uh, hope that um, uh, we all recognize how um, just with the diminishment in uh, uh, automobile travel, what the effect on uh, air quality has been, and, and it's better, and it's healthier. Uh, and um, uh, climate change hasn't gone away. The, the planet keeps warming. It is the existential threat of uh, uh, our world today. And uh, there's a lot of work being done by uh, scientists in this area, and our students are to tremendously uh, focused uh, on this. And so uh, one would hope that uh, that appreciation for science and the advancements that science can make will infiltrate the minds of our political leaders and, and we'll see some uh, greater attention paid there. Let's hope so. Ed, I mean, what about it for you? What does this mean for you? I mean, because you know, plenty of people were pointing fingers at the aviation industry before. Do you expect the pressure on you to take action to reduce your emissions is going to accelerate now? Well, we had, uh, ironically enough, uh, on Valentine's Day this year, we announced that we were committed to offsetting and eliminating all of our, our carbon footprint going forward. Uh, first through purchases of offsets and then investment in things like sustainable aviation fuels and a billion dollar commitment over the next decade to that, to that goal. Well, you know, the good news is that it's not going to cost us as much uh, because the, the footprint's going to be a little smaller for all of us, uh, but we're just as committed to that goal as to eliminate it. And I think it comes back to the word I used earlier, resilience. I mean, the resilience of our environment is just as important as the resilience of our health, the resilience of our balance sheets, and the resilience of our future. And, and uh, we're, we're not going to back down, actually. It's another opportunity to push, push our future forward. So I have to ask you the other big political question, which is, you know, COVID-19 has obviously illuminated and exacerbated income inequality, social inequalities, racial inequalities, and unsurprisingly, has led to an explosion of anger um, and protest. As you are sitting there, the three of you in these leadership positions right now, do you see this as being a beneficial, positive thing? Or are you concerned that the protest is actually potentially taking us down a more ugly path? And how are you responding as organizations to this? Um, Ed, I don't keep, mean to keep putting you on the spotlight, but let me start with you. <laughs> yeah, no, happy to. Uh, I, I think, listen, it's, it absolutely is a good thing. Not what happened, but the fact that this, this time really does feel different. Uh, I think the, the impact that we've all had and probably the pandemic, the, the, the combination of the two crises intersecting and inter interacting with one another caused uh, the, the outcry to the level that we've had has gotten people's attention at, at, a, at, a, at a level I, I don't think it's, it's going to be very, very hard to go back from. Um, you know, George Floyd was unfortunately killed in Minneapolis. Minneapolis is a, a big city of ours. It's our, I, I call it our second home. It's our second largest hub. And uh, our, our people were, were deeply, and we've all been deeply affected, and we still carry, carry that hurt. Um, I think there's, as corporate leaders, there, we, we want to fix things. We want to you know, cure it and put it away. This, is, this doesn't go away. Systemic racism is there that we need to understand. And so one of the most important actions we can all take, I know in our company we're taking, is understanding what it means. What does it look like? And how am I you know, unconsciously, you know, condoning and allowing for systemic racism to come into my own company, which I, I, I find abhorrent and I'm, I'm committed to doing that. And so I think this is going to be a time of, what we call that time of reflection, a time of understanding, and then absolutely a, a, a time of action to make the changes we need, we need going forward. Casey, obviously things like the NFL have been right in the crosshairs of this very polarizing debate. How do you see it playing out yourself in the next few months? And do you think that 
sporting leaders are doing enough to try and channel this anger in a positive way? Um, you're, look, you're going to continue to see, and, and rightfully so, athletes, um, not just black athletes, but all athletes, um, engage in some form of demonstration protest and appropriately so. Um, um, I, I do believe that for the most part, all athletes don't see each other based on the color. They're members of the same team and the same sport. And there, there's a special connection there that is in many ways colorless, nationality list, in some cases, genderless, um, that really breaks down a lot of barriers. It's one of the special things I think about sports and athletics. Um, but to answer your second question, we're, we're, we're not doing enough. Oh, we're, not, we're not doing enough as an industry um, um, to have it be just more than an athlete. Um, uh, there's, I don't know, I think one or two black head coaches in the National Football League. Um, you know, it's just, it's not enough. There, no, there's, there's one team president in all of professional sports who's black, uh, um, Masai Ujiri of the Toronto Raptors. So it's not enough. And, and what you really point to, and, and Janet is really the, in many ways, um, at the front end of this, which is police brutality or is horrific in every regard but we have an opportunity problem. My kids and a kid born on the same day as my kid, 10 miles from where I'm sitting in Compton, California or Watts do not have the same opportunity for success, period, full stop. And that's not what this country was built on and that's not the promise we have made to our kids and that's not right. And until we start to deal with those issues, which is about education and economic opportunity and investment in underserved communities, we're not gonna widen the funnel and create more equal opportunity. So, this is not a check the box exercise. This is a really hard work that takes a long period of time that required us to consistently and relentlessly pursue it. And it's something that matters. It's something that, again, one of these things that I, I do think the, the, the COVID environment has done is showed we are really all connected here. George Floyd lived in Minneapolis. My city of Los Angeles was um, full of protests about that and it sh shined a light on other things in Los Angeles. We are really connected and if we, we believe that, you can't just say I'm okay so that's okay. If we're not all okay then we're not all okay and you can't care about your city or your community or the future of your business and ignore part of the population wholly. And if you think about Watts, California, 3% of the people, 3% of the residents of Watts have a college degree. Is not, I live in Beverly Hills. I can assure you the number is not the same. <laughs> yeah. It is not okay. And so that's, the, that's what we need to deal with. I'm all for reallocation of police funding in the appropriate way so that we could, but the, and just take Los Angeles, the budget of LAUSD, the school district, is greater than the entire budget of the city of LA, inclusive of the police department. You want to talk about a misallocation or a poor spending of dollars? Let's just deal with the real issues. <laughs> and that, that goes back, it's harder, it's not so simple, it's not a simple solution to a complicated problem, but it's how we're gonna solve this over a long period of time. It's about opportunity. Well, Janet, um, I left you to last because I thought in many ways, given your diverse background in Washington at the Department of Homeland Security and given your role now, I'm very curious to know what you make of these protests. Um, first of all, are you concerned that the campus will become a Ex potentially explosive hotbed of protest in the fall and beyond. Um, and do you support the protests or do you think that they have gone too far in times? No, I, I actually, I think this is a very important time uh, in our country. Um, and, uh, you know, the murder in Minneapolis, uh, uh, the other uh, murders um, by law enforcement, people that we entrust to wear a badge and carry a gun uh, are, uh, uh, are not, uh, there is no excuse for them. Uh, and uh, when we talk about structural racism, we have to look at uh, serious police reform. We're doing that at the university. Um, uh, I had already a year ago had a task force on university policing that came out with a number of reforms which we are implementing. We're gonna go back and see, did we do enough? Uh, did we do enough so that 
uh, uh, police are there to promote a culture of safety and partnership uh, as, as to be a uh, the, the metaphor you hear is to be guardians and not warriors. And, and that's, uh, you know, I think one of the uh, important uh, reforms we need to make across the country. And then I couldn't agree more that uh, education and education opportunity uh, is such a reflection of uh, structural racism uh, in, in this country. I'm, I'm proud that, you know, our Board of Regents has uh, decided to wean its way uh, away from using the SAT in the uh, admissions uh, decision uh, because there was such a close correlation between uh, SAT scores and family income uh, as opposed to uh, 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 capability of succeeding in college. Uh, I'm pleased that uh, our board recently uh, voted um, uh, to have the voters of California re-examine uh, the ability to use race, ethnicity, and gender in uh, a number of public benefits, including uh, college admissions. Right now, we're precluded from looking at race, ethnicity, or gender in, in uh, admitting students to a public university. Uh, and that seems to me an artificial limitation. Uh, we have seen through COVID-19 uh, the social variance in, in, in health um, and uh, the disparate impact uh, people uh, uh, who are black, people who are brown. Uh, well, that teaches us something as well. Um, we're, as a, as a country, we are simply not meeting our aspirations and we need to recommit to them. And, and we need to do that, not just episodically right now, but uh, uh, persistently and consistently over the months to come. Right. Well, thank you. Well, we've got a list of fantastic questions, a long list of questions. Um, I should say first up front, we have a heartfelt comment from a physician who wants to thank you all for enforcing mask use. And he asked about testing, or she asked about testing, um, but I think we've probably already touched that. But um, we have an interesting question here, which is from, for Casey, actually. Um, which sporting events, global events, do you expect to happen in 2021? Um, you know, would you put money on the Tokyo Summer Olympic Games, Super Bowl? Um, will they be going ahead? And I imagine that Ed, as a, I believe, a supporter of the Olympics, has a strong interest in that. Um, so, look, the Super Bowl will happen in 2021, and the, the question is, are there fans, or if, if there are fans, how many? Uh, there's going to be a Super Bowl, I can assure you of that, in, in Tampa Bay in, in 2021. Um, the Olympics uh, next summer will happen because what you have as an environment, you just think about a planning scenario, uh, the, the country of Japan can say, okay, the situation is going to be like it is today, which hopefully is worst case from 12 months from now, essentially, or 12 months from now to the games, but let's say it's like this, then you can plan for a games like this, because what you'll do is, it's one of the benefits of being an island. Uh, they might have only Japanese fans who they can easily control both movement and health and quarantine only the necessary people coming over. So athletes and officials and coaches. Uh, it will be a different Olympics, uh, but there will be an Olympics. And I would argue maybe never more important than Olympics to bring the world together. Um, uh, and, and if there's an environment where you could have full fans and a full experience, uh, I have said that if you close your eyes, you, you probably couldn't imagine a more powerful moment than 209 countries and 11,000 athletes from around the world marching uh, together uh, in Tokyo, Japan in the summer of 2021. Uh, talk about a, a picture of the world having come through the worst and, and coming through the other side, that might be the moment because there is no more unifying event than the Olympics, no bigger global event than the Olympics. So, you're going to see all sorts of events. I, I think people, the other thing you're going to start to see, I believe, right now you have a little bit of a panic when you hear the word, like when an athlete tests positive. And I think that's going to start to change. It's going to be, they tested positive, here's what we do, and we move on. And not minimizing the effect and not minimizing the damage or the physical or emotional toll of getting COVID. And in some cases, there's none because they're asymptomatic. But I think the panic around a positive test will subside over time. Uh, just like our understanding of the virus is expanding over time and growing over time and how to manage it and control how it happens. So, you know, look, here's the other thing. And, and, 
Ed knows this, and it's actually the problem. I think Janet has the biggest harm is bu bubbles work. If you can create a bubble, they actually work. Um, you can, and it's really hard to do that on a college campus. Uh, if Ed keeps only healthy people on planes, no one's getting sick on that plane. There's not some magic scenario where the virus appears. You can create a bubble. And so sporting events have a professional sporting events. I will leave college out of it uh, for now, have a unique opportunity uh, to create bubbles around their events. Uh, and hopefully by next summer, we will have seen uh, a transition to a, a different kind of environment. Right, right. I've got a question for you, Ed, um, from Chris Day. Um, recognizing that you do not want to wade into political waters, do you nevertheless feel any responsibility as a prominent CEO to push back against some of this administration's misleading messaging surrounding COVID-19? That's the question, not my words, but are CEOs the new voices of rational leadership during this pandemic? And how important is that during this period of transition? I think that might be called a backhanded compliment. <laughs> so our, our, our job and my job is to protect my people, my 90,000 people and our 200 million customers when they all start to uh, start to fly again uh, and as they're starting to fly again uh, and not wade into a political debate on, on how COVID is, is being handled at, at the national level. Uh, I think corporations are going to be really important in getting our economy back and giving confidence to consumers, uh, protecting our own people. As I said, our 90,000 people, that's my family. I'm going to do my, my very best to understand, test, trace, be able to, to manage them. And as the better job I do, the more confidence will come back into, into travel. You know, one, one of the interesting things about, about the, uh, the airport and, and the air, aircraft experience, and Casey talks about bubble, well, uh, airline is uh, a, a perfect bubble and aircraft. We have found, and largely because of the steps we've taken, the sanitization work we've done, the filtration systems, things that I never knew about at that level, I, I'm now well versed in. If, if we had a real problem with travel, we, our people would be getting sick at you know, really large numbers, given they live in airports, they live in, on aircraft, and all of our frontline customer facing, about 50,000 of our people, are in those jobs as pilots, flight attendants, airport agents, their rate of infection is five times lower than any national average you want to look at. So we're doing a very, very good job of protecting people while they're in the experience. And as when people ask me, is it safe to travel? I say, absolutely, it's safe to travel. People may choose not to travel, which I understand, but it's absolutely safe to travel. And I think each business has to take that kind of accountability and that ownership to protect their own and protect their business model. That's what's going to get us through more than any political uh, you know, leadership that I don't think uh, can, can, uh, can serve that same, same goal. Right. I have a lot of questions for you, Janet, or Secretary. And the reason I called you Janet was because I hate using a title for one panelist and not the others. So um, that was why. But as Secretary, I will now use your correct title because these are the questions directed towards that role um, for the Department of Homeland Security. Um, Trump just announced signing an executive order suspending all foreign work visas, including the H-1B program. What does this mean for the employees and corporations watching today's call and what's your opinion oh i think it's uh, i think it's a terrible idea um uh you know the the united states is a is a talent magnet for the world um our immigration uh system should operate uh to facilitate that uh and by artificially uh suspending or limiting these kinds of visas uh, it's going to be uh, detrimental to the economy of, of the United States and, you know, our ability to uh, uh, be the innovation leader for the future. So um, I, I just think uh, 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 having an agenda that is purely anti-immigrant, uh, uh, re regardless of uh, all the attendant values we get from immigration, is short-sighted in the extreme. I have no and, small opinions here. <laughs> right. Um, another question for you. I'm afraid we do have a number for you, which is, I just saw the University of California won a Supreme Court case on the DACA program. Janet or Secretary, can you walk us through that journey? And if students and workers who are currently employed under the DACA program will be able to continue, or will the Trump administration target them for a deportation? Again, 
De uh, DACA stands for Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. It's a program uh, I started when I was Secretary of Homeland Security. It's uh, designed uh, for young people um, brought to this country, typically under the age of six, who have grown up here, who are in our colleges and universities, who are parents who've started businesses, who are in the military, but they're undocumented. And uh, it seemed to me then, as it seems to me now, um, uh, 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 unreasonable uh, and inconsistent with good immigration policy and our values to uh, put them under the risk of deportation. Uh, and so the program started at, at its peak, about 800,000 young people were registered in DACA. Uh, uh, the Trump administration in 2017 tried to rescind the program uh, the, the University of California was the first university in the country to sue, to enjoin that. Uh, we got the injunction. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, people have been able to stay in the program and re-enroll. You have to re-enroll every two years uh, while that injunction has been in place. Uh, and last Thursday, the Supreme Court uh, agreed with us that uh, 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 the administration's action in rescinding the program was arbitrary and capricious. So the program is, is for this day and train alive and well. Uh, the Trump administration has tweeted that they're gonna go back and uh, try to rescind it the right way this time. Uh, whether they'll have uh, time to do that between now and the um, end of uh, this term, I think is uh, highly uh, doubtful. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, those in DACA uh, can continue to enroll and re-enroll. And those who meet the qualifications of DACA, but who have not yet entered the program, uh, now have the ability to actually enter the program and become uh, DACA themselves. So uh, it was a good win uh, for us in the Supreme Court. Uh, uh, ultimately, however, uh, this is going to require Congress to act. Um, it's one of the many immigration issues that is on uh, uh, Congress's lap. And, and at some point, they're going to have to deal with it. Right. Well, we have time for just one other quick question, which is, I'm going to ask a quick question to Ed, which um, has come from uh, Weibach Parikh, who's asked a question I think a lot of people would like to know about, which is, you've said that you are seeing leisure travel, but not business travel. What can you do to push up business travel? so that it gives a boost to economic growth. Or another way of putting this is how can you tempt all the keen business travelers watching this call who are actually quite happy staying at home right now to get back on a plane again? What well, can you do apart from lots of nice food and lots, yeah. more, lots more sky mile points, I hope? <laughs> well, there, there are great bargains out there. There's no question about it on price. People, people are attracted to price, but it tends not to be the corporate business traveler. You know, there, there's, a, first of all, you know, corporations have to look at the safety and well-being of their people and, and the care that they take over them. And we have, we have changed everything about our boarding processes, the cleanliness of our aircraft. We fog every single aircraft with electrostatic foggers before they take off, every single flight. At Delta, we've capped the load factors at 60%. We will not board a plane more than 60% full, which guarantees wherever you're sitting on the plane, the seat next to you, is going to be open and we've committed to doing that through through the end of september and we'll revisit we'll see where we are in september and, and we'll continue to keep caps in place whether it's at 60 percent or some other number going forward uh, so corporations are telling us they are uh, ready to travel the biggest question is what are they going to do if, if other businesses aren't open if conventions aren't being held if sporting events aren't, aren't, aren't open to fans there's really a chicken and an egg they're probably getting ready to go. They just need something to go to, to be able to, uh, to start. So it's got, it needs to be hand in glove, but we're, we're ready on our side. The other thing about travel, which is really interesting, is that we're gonna start business travel back through leisure travel, because business travelers travel le for leisure as well. And it's, it's amazing for anyone out there that uh, hasn't traveled during these last few months uh, air travel. You know, even though they grew up traveling and they were a road warrior, when they get back into the airport, it looks like a, like a foreign territory to them. You know, how do I do this again? And how do I kind of, what do I have to do? Is there changes to go through the security? And how do we board planes? We now board planes, by the way, from the back to the front. 
to, to avoid people interacting with it, each other. Typically, we put the first class in first and people filter back. Well, we do it just the opposite to keep, to keep flow and to keep social distancing uh, uh, mandates and requirements. You require masks, so you have to wear a mask throughout the airport as well as on the plane, as well as when you get off the plane. So it's really a very, very safe experience. And our customers, we measure our net promoter score in terms of how customers value. Our net promoter scores for those people that are traveling are about 15 points higher than they've ever <laughs> And, and it's, it's a combination of all those things. There's not any one of those things. And, and the filtration systems I talked about, the high-grade uh, HEPA filters that we use on board our planes, the air, the air is incredibly clean. So the quality of, of all of those steps is providing a really safe experience, but we've got to kind of push people out, and we've got to inspire them to travel. So I think we've done a lot of the rational things. We're now at the point we need the inspirational opportunities with Disney opening and with the you know, Vegas opening and hopefully we'll get we'll get uh, we'll get some sporting events and other events that people could start to get to maybe golf uh, as as initial initial first step but it's coming slowly but it's it, it's we're ready for it we're ready for it well, I think that's a very good note to end on because in many ways it sums up the key, three key messages I take away from this discussion. One is that we've just gone through an absolutely once unimaginable set of shocks. I mean, who would have guessed that we'd all be wearing masks on planes, that we'd all be boarding the, boarding the plane through the back and that Delta would willingly ensure that we all have a seat next to us on a plane. Um, who would have guessed that, you know, we'd be able to looking at campuses where online learning is driving so much of the activity or where essentially we're having sports come back, but not sports as we knew it. And the, Japan, the Tokyo Olympics may be Japanese only. But the message that's come out loud and clear today is that we have seen extraordinary resilience and inventiveness as we've gone through this extraordinary shock um, in all kinds of unexpected ways. Um, so that's good news and let's hope that continues. But I think the other thing I've very much taken away from today is that we are not gonna have a sudden return back to normal. Um, as you said, Ed, it could be a three year um, experience or three year journey. Um, it's gonna be pretty tough. And so when we look at the debate about whether it's gonna be a V, a U, a Nike swoosh or a square root sign or a W, um, let's hope it's not an L anyway. Um, it's certainly, in my view, more likely to be heading towards a U at best, probably a Nike swoosh. Um, but in the meantime, I'd just like to say thank you to all of you for chatting so openly and honestly about so many issues which the people watching really care about. And on behalf of everyone watching, can I say a heartfelt good luck in trying to get us all back to normal in your different spheres. And let's all keep trying to pull together. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.